Dr. Rattan is an Associate Professor of Sarcoma Medical Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. He provides care to a large panel of patients with a wide range of soft tissue and bone sarcomas. His clinical research focuses on new treatments for several sarcoma subtypes, including Ewing sarcoma, epithelioid sarcoma, and desmoid tumors. Dr. Rattan is also an active educator lecturing on sarcoma to multiple physician training programs across the state and often to patients and caregivers at educational events. So we have Dr. Rattan doing our systemic portion of this presentation, and then Dr. Faruqi is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. In his appointment to the Melanoma and Sarcoma Radiation Oncology section, he specializes in the treatment of bone and soft tissue sarcomas, melanomas, and other non-melanoma skin malignancies. And Dr. Fruki will be doing the local current treatments for sarcoma portion of this presentation. So without further ado, Dr. Atan, go ahead, take it away. Thank you. All right. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to the Sarcoma Alliance for uh, putting this together. Um, I wasn't able to join at the beginning of the of the session this morning, but on behalf of MD Anderson, uh, we're just we're very appreciative uh, that the Sarcoma Alliance was able to help us uh, or collaborate with us, I should say, I should say uh, in putting together this program for you uh, and having a chance uh, for us to all sit down. So I hope that all of you have enjoyed the talk so far. Um, and that the rest of the weekend is equally fruitful. Uh, we look forward to engaging with you. Um, uh, like Candace said, I'm going to be talking about systemic therapies for sarcoma. And I think this talk, I think, is best thought of as one that's going to be paired with one that's being given by Dr. Nassif a little bit later this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about sort of traditional chemotherapy. Uh, and I chose a subset of those to dive into a little bit. And then she'll be talking about targeted and experimental therapies, immune therapies, things like that, a little bit later on this afternoon. So do stay tuned for that. Um, uh, next slide, please. You may have to scroll to that. Sorry about that. There we go. Yeah. So um, what do we what do we mean when we say systemic therapy? We're talking about a medicine that you either take by mouth or that you have administered to you uh, intravenously through an IV, which enters the bloodstream. And by entering the bloodstream, it's delivered to all parts of your body. And it means that it can attack tumors that we can see on a CAT scan or that you might be able to feel. Uh, but it also attacks microscopic disease that you can't see, but you infer is there because of the type of cancer one has or because there's tumors in other places that can be seen. Um, we sometimes give this to people as a way of controlling cancer that can't be removed. Uh, it is also used in what we call the adjuvant setting. And I'll be using that word a lot today. Adjuvant treatment is treatment when we, is when we give a medicine uh, or another therapy to someone who has had their tumor removed or is going to have their tumor removed with the goal of curing them. So a localized patient can still, a patient with a localized tumor can still get chemotherapy um, with the goal of decreasing their risk of the cancer returning. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the talk. Um, I should just mention also just um, for any of my colleagues that are on the talk, feel free if you wish to engage uh, with the questions in the chat. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end as well, but I think that way we can ensure that people are getting uh, responses. So feel free if you if you wish. Next slide, please. Okay. So systemic therapies are, are broken up into a few different groups and there's different ways to do this. But the way that I did um, was to first talk about traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy. And this is what most people mean or what they think about when you think about chemotherapy, right? So these are medicines that are given that essentially attack the machinery used by cells to divide. Um, and because normal cells in your body also tend to divide, uh, the side effects related to these treatments tend to be more pronounced in tissues that are turning over rapidly. That's why many chemotherapy agents cause people to lose their hair, develop mouth sores, um, can impact fertility. These are all areas in the body where cells tend to divide relatively rapidly, like cancer cells do. And so what we typically do is we use chemotherapy to exploit that rapid division process in cancer to sensitize and, and assume that the cancer is going to be more sensitive to the chemotherapy than normal tissues in the body. Like I said, the off-target effects often tend to be hair loss, uh, bone marrow side effects, people can become anemic, 
uh, have a low white blood cell count and be prone to infection because the bone marrow, which makes blood, is a place where cells divide rapidly. And infertility is one that's often discussed as well. Targeted agents are a very broad category of uh, drugs. There are some specific targeted agents which impact the formation of new blood vessels. And that's something that tumors need to be able to do to grow. They need to be able to induce your body to create new blood vessels to feed them. So the, the medicines that we typically use to inhibit blood vessel formation are used broadly across many sarcomas. Um, and the side effects of those medicines are also blood vessel related for the most part. High blood pressure, uh, wound healing complications, and skin changes are commonly seen. Um, and then there's a whole category of other specific targeted agents that are targeted to specific subtypes of sarcoma or specific mutations. And I didn't go into a lot of depth there uh, because not all sarcomas and not all patients with sarcoma have targeted therapies available, although most will be candidates for treatment with a blood vessel inhibitor at some point. Then we have immunotherapy, and that's an expanding category uh, in sarcoma. So immunotherapies are medicines that we use that somehow modify the way that the immune system works uh, in hopes that it will attack the cancer more effectively than it has, right? And immunotherapy has been a, in a game changer in some cancers, most specifically melanoma. For sarcoma, it's definitely made a meaningful contribution in some specific subtypes of sarcoma, and that, that list is expanding. Uh, it's something that's worth asking about as you sort of go through a treatment journey. Um, Off-target or side effects for immune therapies are not the hair loss and bone marrow suppression or the high blood pressure that you see with these other agents. Specifically, what happens with most immunotherapies is that it increases the risk for an autoimmune complication. Your, your body's immune system, in addition to attacking the cancer, may begin to attack normal tissues and can cause diseases like type 1 diabetes, thyroid dysfunction, and rarely even severe autoimmune disorders that can be uh, life-threatening. Uh, those are not commonly seen, but it's important to recognize that even immunotherapy, which we think of as, or often people think of it as sort of this natural treatment, can have significant side effects in some patients. Next slide, please. So why do we give chemotherapy? What's the intent? What am I hoping to achieve when I offer a treatment to a patient, right? So uh, the most common reason is palliative treatment, right? Palliative treatment is treatment that is given with the intent of prolonging life and delaying the onset of symptoms related to cancer. Um, sometimes that comes at the price of symptoms related to the treatment, which might be mild or very significant depending on the treatment and depending on the patient. I intentionally use the word palliative because that is how oncologists describe this kind of treatment. But patients often interpret palliative to mean that something terrible is about to happen to them. And I have had patients who have been on palliative treatment with different medicines for, for decades. And people can be on palliative treatment until they live their normal life expectancy. So being told that you're on palliative chemotherapy isn't necessarily transmitting uh, a prognosis or a life expectancy. Um, there may be one associated with that, and that's a question that you should ask. But that word, I think, uh, is often thought of differently by doctors and patients. And so I wanted to put that on the slide and discuss that. The other two settings in which we give chemotherapy are uh, curative settings for patients who are either going to undergo surgery or have already undergone surgery. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy is the term that is used when chemotherapy is given prior to a surgery. The purpose of giving that chemotherapy can be twofold. The first is that you are concerned that this tumor has high risk characteristics and has probably sent microscopic tumor cells throughout a patient's body. And you are giving chemotherapy to try to kill off that microscopic disease in hopes that you will make it so that the patient doesn't recur in a distant site after they've had their, their tumor surgically removed. The advantages to giving it prior to surgery are that you have the tumor in place and you can actually watch to see if the tumor is shrinking or responding. And that will give you a sense as to whether your treatment is effective for that patient's cancer. Neoadjuvant or before surgery chemotherapy can also be given with the intent of shrinking a tumor to make a surgery less morbid, meaning having less long-term complications for a patient, a smaller tumor might be easily to take, easy to take out, or even converting a patient uh, from a situation where surgery is not possible to one where it is. Adjuvant treatment's a similar idea. You're giving chemotherapy after surgery, but now you don't have a tumor in place to watch. So we're giving chemotherapy, trying to mop up anything that might have traveled 
to other sites in the body before the patient's tumor was removed, but very often we're giving a predetermined number of cycles of treatment and not really being able to assess whether that specific patient is responding to the treatment or not. Okay, next slide, please. So some examples of commonly used sarcoma treatments, and this is not a complete list by any means. I just wanted to give you a sense of what we're talking about. And if you put, push next again, next slide, yep. I'm gonna be focusing on these four agents um, just because there's a long list. And my, my hope here was one to focus on a set of treatments that many patients with many different subtypes of sarcoma are going to receive. The others tend to get a little bit more specific in terms of who gets them and also talk with you about how I think about how to use these therapies as a sarcoma expert, uh, rather than someone who is simply reading guidelines and applying them. Um, you know, most of the sarcoma guidelines will spell out the drugs that are available, and an oncologist can read those guidelines and administer those agents at those doses. But some of the, the subtleties of sort of how we decide the schedule of administration, who gets what drugs, uh, can be lost when you're, when you're sort of treating to guidelines. And I think to sort of Piggyback on to Dr. Forsher and Dr. D'Amato's comments earlier, it's one of the reasons that I think there's value in ensuring that at least at some point, your case is reviewed by someone who sees a high volume of sarcoma patients. Next slide, please. So the first drug we're gonna talk about is one that many of you on the call may be familiar with. It's doxorubicin. Um, this is a medicine that's been around for a long time. It's been used widely in the treatment of sarcoma until the, uh, since the late 60s and early 70s. Um, it's a derivative of a compound that's isolated from soil bacteria. And I like to say that sometimes because I think that I, I talk with patients who don't recognize that many, many of the chemotherapy drugs that we use from vincristine, which is isolated from uh, plants to um, uh, taxol, which is another one that's isolated from plants to doxorubicin, which is a fungal compound or a bacterial compound. Uh, many of these drugs are sort of very purified or modified versions of natural products. Um, the way that it works is it interferes with DNA replication. And so it's a cytotoxic chemotherapy. It interferes with the machinery that cells use to, to duplicate their DNA before they divide. Side effects include nausea, mouth sores, weakening of the heart muscle, which is one that's often talked about, and we'll get into that a little bit more, and second cancers. There's about a 1% chance of developing a second cancer at some point in the future as a consequence of getting doxorubicin. Uh, but generally speaking, when we're administering this, um, it's because the risks outweigh the benefits. So typically when that happens, it's either a leukemia or a myelodysplastic syndrome. It's a long-term risk. It's low, about 1%, but when you treat hundreds of patients, unfortunately, you do see it. Um, next slide. So um, you can push advance again. So one thing that we learned early on in the treatment of sarcoma with doxorubicin is that unlike breast cancer and lymphoma, where it is commonly still used, the more doxorubicin that you give a patient, the more likely they are to respond to it. And what that means is that for sarcoma chemotherapy, the doses of doxorubicin that are typically used are significantly higher than those that are used for more common cancers. And so one of the things that we often see in patients that are being treated at a place that doesn't do a lot of sarcoma treatment is that the doses are sometimes decreased because there's just not comfort giving the medicines at the doses that we give. Um, next slide, please. Looking at this data another way, what you see is that you know, going from a 45 milligram dose on this is the bottom uh, that I'm reading here, 45 milligrams to 60 milligrams to 75 milligrams, uh, more patients respond to the treatment. And that is why, like I said, the dose that is given to abdoxorubicin for patients in sarcoma uh, is commonly higher. Next slide, please. So one thing I wanted to focus a little bit on is cardiac toxicity, because this is something that patients are often interested in. And even my, 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 my trainees, the, the, the oncology fellows, cardiac toxicity is the first thing they talk about uh, when we talk about doxorubicin side effects. And, you know, there are some things that can be done to try to mitigate the side effects. Cardiac toxicity is, is often lower if you give, it, give the doxorubicin as a prolonged infusion. So for patients with, for example, breast cancer, most, of, most are accustomed to coming in, receiving their nausea medicines, and then they get their doxorubicin over 15 minutes or an hour, a short amount of time. And when I started giving talks like this eight or 10 years ago, our standard way of giving doxorubicin was not over one hour. It was over 72 hours as a continuous infusion. The patient would carry around a bag. And many places still do it that way, or they do it in divided doses over three days. And the reason to do that is to decrease the risk of cardiac side effects. 
but there is a price that you pay. One is convenience. It's, it's you have to get the treatment for a few days instead of just one day. And the second is that it actually increases the likelihood of mouth sores. And so we used to see many more patients come into the hospital with mouth sores that would prevent them from eating or drinking for some period of time. Um, the more modern way of doing cardiac protection is to administer an additional medicine called dexrazoxane. Um, it's a medicine that can be given to protect the heart. And, you know, it's been around for quite some time, but even five or six years ago, I think that its use in sarcoma was typically held by most centers until the patient had received four or five cycles of chemotherapy and we're getting a high cumulative dose of doxorubicin. And there's two reasons for that. One is that it was expensive. Um, although insurance does typically cover it. I never, I never speak for any specific insurance company, but in our experience, that tends not to be an issue. Um, and there were theoretical concerns that will evoke, okay, if you're protecting the heart muscle from the tumor, maybe you're protecting the heart as well. Um, and, you know, I think there's increasing data, both in sarcoma patients and then also in children treated for leukemia and things like that uh, with doxorubicin, where the cancer outcomes don't seem to be worse when Xenocard, which is dexrazoxane, is used. And so at MD Anderson, our standard approach is to give chemotherapy, give the doxorubicin with dexrazoxane starting for, from the first milligram. Um, you will see some variability in that in sarcoma centers across the country, but a reasonable question to ask is about whether they're using a cardioprotective strategy to administer the doxorubicin. It's important because yes, you don't want to run into heart side effects, but secondly, doxorubicin tends to be a very effective drug for many patients with sarcoma, not all. Um, and sometimes we want to go back and give more of it in the future. Uh, there's this thought out there that you can't get more than 450 milligrams per meter squared of doxorubicin over the course of your life. Um, because at that point, the risk of cardiac side effects does start to take off. Um, but for sarcoma patients, sometimes we need to do that. And knowing that we've given cardio protection gives us comfort um, in exceeding that sort of maximum dose, noting that that maximum dose was derived from patients that received no cardio protection at all. Next slide, please. Ifosamide, we'll talk briefly about this one because it's it's sort of uh, one of the more commonly used sarcoma agents as well. This is another one that's been around for a long time. Um, we've known about it since the 70s, but couldn't use it because everybody who gets ifosamide um, will have bleeding in their bladder unless they get an additional medicine called mesna, which wasn't available until about the 80s. So if you or a loved one has received ifosamide, you may recall taking either uh, mesna tablets or being uh, given an infusion of mesna may even have had to carry a bag around for 24 hours uh, while you're getting the ifosamide, and that makes the drug usable. Side effects of this are kidney injury, neurotoxicity. It's used to treat some other cancers, again, at much lower doses. And I think the thing that to understand about ifosamide is that the administration of this drug relative to other chemotherapies is kind of labor intensive. Many places have to put patients in the hospital for four, five, six days to get ifosamide. And even if you're doing it as an outpatient, patients have to come in daily to get their treatments. They're often going home with the bag. Um, it is harder to sort of administer than many of the other treatments that we give, and in some ways can be quite toxic, specifically the kidney injury and neurotoxicity. Next slide. So one thing that tends to come up in sarcoma um, when we're sort of frontline treating patients is, should we give doxorubicin by itself or should we add another agent to try to make it work better? And I think you'll find variable practice around this at sarcoma centers around the country, even among people who really know what they're doing. Uh, doxorubicin and decarbazine is an old combination. And I think this is, a, this is a slide from a scientific talk, but what I'm trying to show you in the middle column there under response rate is that when you add decarbazine to doxorubicin, the response rate, which is the, the likelihood that the tumor shrinks is much better with two drugs instead of one. But you pay a price for that in terms of side effects. And the reason that not everyone is so excited about just that response rate being higher is it might be true that you could do doxorubicin first and then just do the second drug like decarbazine after doxorubicin. The patient's going to be on treatment for longer, but will have less acute side effects, less likelihood of being hospitalized. And it may be that their life expectancy ultimately ends up being the same. Next slide. So... The most recent combination regimen that I think that we've been using, well, not the most recent now, and we'll talk about that in a second, but sort of the classic one is AIM or doxorubicin and ifostamide. And this regimen has been around for about 20 years, and it basically wasn't, it wasn't possible to do until hematologic growth factors, injections that allow the immune system to recover from the chemotherapy faster, uh, were developed. Nupagen and Nulasta are some that you folks may be familiar with. 
Um, and it allows us to maximize the doses of doxorubicin and nifosamide. And we talked about how for those two agents, we have to use the medicines at high doses in order to get them to work the best in sarcoma. Uh, the response rates were much higher than we had seen in other combination trials. And so this is what we typically give for patients if you're going to give a combination treatment in the front line. If patients are young and healthy, and I define young as less than 60, um, this often ends up being the first choice regimen. But not for everyone. And there has been controversy as to whether doing it this way versus doing doxorubicin by itself makes more sense. Next slide, please. So why would we not give combination therapy, right? We've got all of these combinations with doxorubicin that seem to make tumors shrink more. But when you look to see if patients actually live longer in the end, no studies were actually demonstrating that. And there's lots of reasons why that might be the case. One of them might be that it doesn't improve survival. It just makes the tumor smaller, but then you're burning two options instead of one at the beginning. Um, the other possibility is that, you know, overall survival takes a long time to measure. You have to have a lot of patients. Everything that that patient receives after you give that first treatment is going to make it harder to detect a difference at the end of a patient's life. And so, you know, people have sort of debated as to whether this is the best strategy or not. And I think it goes back to sort of what the goals of therapy are. If you're trying to shrink someone's tumor um, because you're trying to get them to a surgery, then combination therapy makes sense. If someone's primary goal is to have sort of minimal symptoms from treatment um, and maybe continue to be able to work, minimize the risk of hospitalization, then single agent doxorubicin might be a better fit. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of data real quick. Next slide. So these are called Kaplan-Meier curves, and I recognize for patients who are not used to looking at them, uh, it doesn't mean a lot. What we're showing you here, though, is that uh, I'm going to direct your attention to the curve on the right. And what you're going to see is they do sort of separate. So patients who get doxorubicin and nifosamide, they seem to be doing better uh, for a while, but eventually they sort of fuse at the end at right around 30 months. And so when you actually analyze this data, there's this trend towards an improvement in overall survival, but it wasn't um, it wasn't statistically significant. In other words, uh, it didn't meet the criteria that the study required in order for us to be able to tell if that was a real difference. And that's why people walked away from this big study with some doing one and some doing the other. other. And so I think getting a recommendation for one or the other isn't necessarily a reflection of someone's knowledge, but this remains an area of debate in the community. MD Anderson tends to favor combination therapy more so than some other sites. Um, there are others that are, are, mo are more pro-single agent. My own view is that, you know, I do my best to talk to patients and explain sort of the pros and cons and, and go from there. Next slide. Okay, so um, we sort of talked about this, but what I would say is combination chemotherapy, if you're trying to shrink a tumor or get someone to surgery, it's the right thing to do. But if a patient is trying to minimize side effects along the way, single agent therapy may potentially be a better option. And that's a conversation that you can have with your doctor. Um, next slide. Just cognizant of time, I'm gonna to try to move a little bit faster. I wanted to mention this, doxorubicin and trabectidin. This is a brand new regimen um, that was sort of developed and studied by the French and published last year. Um, and it's typically for leiomyosarcoma. I thought folks might have questions about it. Um, I'm not talking a whole lot about trabectidin today, but for our patients who have leiomyosarcoma, we're doing a lot more of this regimen and a little less of doxorubicin and nifosamide. And I can talk a little bit about that in the question and answer session if folks have questions. Next slide, please. All right. So this is this last chemotherapy regimen we're going to talk about. Then we'll have a quick discussion about adjuvant treatment and we'll stop there. So gemcitabine and docetaxel. Gemcitabine has been a drug that's been around for a long time, uh, initially developed for pancreas cancer. And when you're sarcoma and you are trying to sort of make progress in your disease, you try the drugs that have been approved in other cancers and yours as well. And gemcitabine clearly had activity in these studies um, and sort of quickly became something that was being used. Docetaxel really doesn't have single agent activity in sarcoma, but there was this sense for various reasons that the combination might be synergistic. You might get it to work better. And so some, some initial studies did show hints of increased efficacy with the combination, which led to a big randomized trial. Next slide. And this is what it is. These curves, I'm just going to ask you to take my word for it, are different from one another. The blue line is higher than the yellow line on both sides. Um, and that means that in this study, the combination of dose, the gemcitabine and docetaxel, the patients had um, a longer time before the tumor grew on treatment and lived longer when they got the combination. Next slide. 
Um, but the, the problem with it was that docetaxel is the is, is a hard drug to take. Gemcitabine for most patients is much more straightforward. And so what you see here, and again, you're not used to looking at these, but patients who are getting the combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel, the blue line, it starts to tick up. And those are the patients who are discontinuing treatment because it's too toxic. Whereas with gemcitabine alone, you can see that dotted yellow line just kind of hugs the bottom line there. Patients don't often discontinue gemcitabine due to side effects or toxicity. And so, you know, this study suggested that dose tax will add something for survival, but it is much more hard. It's much harder to take. And gemcitabine by itself is a much gentler treatment. Next slide. And I mentioned that because the French did another trial looking at patients specifically with leiomyosarcoma where they found the opposite conclusion, that docetaxel does not seem to add anything to gemcitabine uh, in terms of progression-free survival or overall survival. It just adds side effects. And so there is dissatisfaction with docetaxel being combined with gemcitabine. And my approach there is that if patients are having a hard time with docetaxel when they're taking this regimen, I drop the dose really quickly or I get rid of it altogether. And for some sarcomas, it may be just the same as taking gemcitabine by itself. So those are two examples of things that I'm often adjusting when I'm seeing patients for, for second opinions. And I wanted to, to share those two. So combination therapy and then docetaxel with gemcitabine, yes or no. Next slide, please. All right, we'll, we'll keep going. Next slide. Okay, so take home points. Chemotherapy is the main treatment for most patients with metastatic cancer. Surgery, radiation can be used, but very selectively and to solve specific problems. Regimens can vary in terms of their efficacy, their side effects, and their schedule. And that's a lot of what I'm doing when I see patients for second opinions. And sort of the ultimate selection of a regimen shouldn't be reading from a list. We need to tailor this to a patient's goals. And that's what we try our best to do uh, in our conversations with folks. And I think it's a reasonable expectation for you to have of your treatment team. Next slide. All right, I know we're running low on time, but I just want to get through this relatively quickly. Adjuvant treatment is giving chemotherapy um, to uh, decrease the risk of cancer coming back after it's surgically removed. And this has been an area of debate. Who sh should we be giving chemotherapy or is it, does, it, does it work well enough to sort of justify the side effects? Who should get it? Who shouldn't? And this is another area where you will find there is disagreement across different expert centers and another place where a second opinion may be of utility to you, even if you're seeing a, tre a treatment team that knows what they're doing. Next slide. So the reason that there's controversy is that these studies are difficult to do. When you're dealing with a common diagnosis like breast cancer, you can run a study uh, with a thousand women who have a very similar type of breast cancer uh, do it, enroll it in a year or two and get an answer in three or four or five years. Uh, doing a, a thousand patient study in sarcoma is impossible. And it also it requires lumping together a bunch of different types of sarcoma, which then makes it much more difficult to interpret the results. The other issue with adjuvant chemotherapy is that people have been doing it. And so, you know, if I see a high risk patient and we have a study that's available out there somewhere where half the patients get chemotherapy and half the patients don't get chemotherapy, if I think that patient's at high risk, I'm not going to put them on the study because I don't want to flip a coin and have them not get treatment that I would otherwise give them. Um, next slide. So I just want to show you two examples of that. So this is a study that was done in Europe um, where they took patients with intermediate or high-grade sarcoma. Um, and that means sarcoma that either looks like it's got a potential to spread or that it might have a potential to spread and randomized them to surgery. Uh, they, they all went to surgery, and then half the patients got chemotherapy with doxorubicin and nifosamide, the regimen that we discussed earlier, and half the patients got no further treatment, just observation. Next slide. And what that study showed was that there was no benefit to getting chemotherapy, that doxorubicin and nifosamide, or just watching the patients, the ultimate outcome was the same. And so the, what, what I'm trying to show you the two there is those lines are just sitting on top of each other. They're not spread out. Next slide. But it turns out that there was problems with that study. It most of the patients um, had, many of the patients had small tumors. Many of the patients didn't actually have the tumors that were, that were at the highest risk of spread. Next slide. And, you know, why would that be? Um, well, again, we talked about how patients, uh, physicians don't want to put their highest risk patients on the study. And so a lot of the patients that were on the study really weren't at particularly high risk of having metastatic disease in the first place. And so showing a difference becomes harder. Next slide. 
So how do we address that? Well, we've gotten much better at trying to decide who's at high risk or low risk of their cancer coming back after a surgery. And one way to do that is with this tool called the Sarculator. It's an app. You can download it and you know you can plug your tumor in if you wish to do so. Um, and it spits out a sort of estimate of how likely you are to have your tumor come back in the future. And so if you take that study from before where the um, where it didn't show any benefit to chemotherapy, next slide, and you apply the sarculator to it. So on the left, you have the survival curve. You have two curves that are just sitting on top of each other from the original study. On the right, you have the same curve, but now broken up by low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk populations. And what I want you to do is ignore the green. That's the low risk patients. You can see that those the, the green solid line and the green dotted line are sitting on top of each other. But look at the red. For the same study, for those patients that really had high risk characteristics for their tumor, you can see that the dotted red line is much higher than the uh, solid red line. And that suggests that those patients really benefited from chemotherapy. In fact, it took their risk of relapse and cut it in half. Next slide. So all of that to say that, you know, in an appropriately selected group of patients, um, chemotherapy does in fact improve survival. And I think there have been additional studies that have, um, have demonstrated that. I think we're sort of coming up on time here. So I'm going to sort of cut my remarks short because the rest of the slides are another illustration of that same concept. But the take home point here is that patients who have localized sarcomas may still benefit from chemotherapy. It is not all patients, it's just high risk patients. And how you define high risk is still something the community is trying to determine and there is room for style differences there. And so another place where a second opinion can be helpful is if someone is having a tumor removed, the question of whether they should get chemotherapy before or after may be different even at expert sarcoma centers. So I'm gonna stop there so we can zoop all the way to the end. I've got a slide there about questions and I'll hand it off to Asan. That was great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Rotan. Um, so uh, I think the introduction was done uh, you know, earlier, um, but uh, just to recap, my name is uh, San Faruqi and I am one of the four radiation oncologists at MD Anderson Cancer Center that, uh, you know, treats sarcomas with radiation. Um, I apologize. I, I think if there's a little bit of a hum in the background. I, you know, uh, I think the, my, my neighbor's mowing his lawn, um, so I, I apologize, but I think he's almost done, but that's, that's what that is. You're not hearing anything. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Great. So, uh, you know, I think uh, you guys are no stranger to what a soft tissue sarcoma is, but I think it's important uh, for us to understand sort of the origin of soft tissue sarcoma, especially when we are looking at local therapies, uh, which is the focus of my talk today. So, uh, you know, a quick reminder, you know, soft tissue sarcomas can arise from any form of non-epithelial tissue. So that could be connective tissue, that could be fatty tissue, that could be muscle. Um, it could even be the linings uh, of the blood vessels uh, that are pretty much found throughout our body. Um, and actually that includes nerves as well. And there's a subset of soft tissue sarcomas that, you know, arise from nerves. So we can go to the next slide. So, you know, sarcoma is a spectrum of clinical behavior. And again, this is very important when, you know, we talk about the ideal treatment. Um, there's over 200 types of sarcoma actually, and they all have their own characteristics. So, you know, we tend to look at them from a standpoint of the risk and or tendency to recur locally, which we, you know, the term that you're going to see here that I'm going to use today is local recurrence, all the abbreviated as LR. And then DM basically stands for distant metastasis. So there's a group of sarcomas that are considered benign. Of course, the classic example of that is a, is a lipoma. And then there's borderline tumors um, that, you know, a smaller percentage uh, have a tendency to metastasize, but by and large, I think the risk of local recurrence for these is much higher than distant. And then we have the more malignant or high-grade tumors um, for which, you know, uh, Dr. Rotan and Dr. Nassif for talking to you guys, uh, where systemic therapies are very critical because, you know, I think having a good agent that prevents the spread of sarcomas is key in the management um, for those cases. So we can go to the next slide. I'll also try to skip through the introduction pretty quickly so we can kind of talk about, you know, more about the treatment. Um, but again, I think it's, it's important to understand the anatom anatomical aspect of soft tissue sarcoma. So again, 
if we are looking at the classic patient that presents to us, they usually say, hey, I've had this slow-growing mass. They tend to be painless um, as opposed to like an infection or some other inflammatory process that tends to be, you know, present more rapidly with pain associated. Um, and you can see here that the limbs, which are the most common place where we see soft tissue sarcomas, are basically divided into compartments. And that plays a key role when we're looking at sort of the local and infiltrative spread. That's also why MRI imaging is re really critical um, because it, it basically tells us as physicians what is the major route that the specific sarcoma is taking to spread. Is it trying to invade deep? Is it growing more along the fascial plane? So that's why MRI imaging is critical when we see a patient with soft tissue sarcoma instead of CT-based imaging. So we can go to the next slide. This is a really a great illustration because, you know, this is, again, kind of how surgeons and radiation oncologists look at, you know, the risk of spread for a soft tissue sarcoma. So you can see here if you have a tumor that's in the posterior aspect of the thigh or the calf, it's not really going to spread uh, anterior, posterior, left or right. It's going to kind of track along the plane and the fascia of the muscle. So when we're delineating what is at risk or when we're deciding what surgery to do, these are the sort of characteristics that we're looking at. What are the muscles involved? What are the associated soft tissues surrounding the muscle that are involved? And, you know, how much of a margin do we need adequately to make sure it doesn't come back? We'll go to the next slide. Um, so for a workup, I'm just going to highlight the key thing here, which is, you know, we always recommend and we're always talking to our the, the outside doctors, you know, who... Uh, basically are the primary care physicians, um, and we're, we always remind them that a core biopsy is, is needed. We, we don't like for anyone to undergo an excisional uh, surgery without first establishing what is the tissue diagnosis. So I think that's really key, and where we run into trouble sometimes when we see patients that are diagnosed on the outside um, is they'll go basically to a surgeon, and the surgeon will say, well, I'm pretty sure this is a sarcoma, but rather than subject you to a biopsy and then a surgery, why don't we just do the surgery? So, you know, we, we've actually shown that, you know, that is not good. We want to avoid unplanned excisions. Um, and so we're always trying to educate um, all of our colleagues to make sure that a biopsy is always done. You know, the next slide. I'm going to skip over the staging here, but I think the, the biggest thing to highlight is, you know, before we come up with a treatment plan, we do assign a stage, and that is largely based on two things. Um, the first is size, and the other thing is grade. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight is, you know, all cancers are not the same. So a stage 3 sarcoma is very different than a stage 3 breast cancer. So a lot of times I have patients coming to me and you say, oh, my friend had breast cancer. She was stage 3. That means it went to the lymph nodes. You're telling me I have a stage 3 sarcoma has my cancer gone to the lymph nodes? And the answer is no, um, because every uh, basically cancer and tumor type has a different staging system. And for sarcomas, you know, if you are stage one to three, that means your disease is localized. And stage four basically means it has spread to a lymph node or to a distant metastatic site. So it, it is different than most other cancers. Go to the next slide. So the general approach when we're thinking of local therapy um, and treatments in general is for stage one tumors, which are the small tumors, sometimes surgery by itself is sufficient. I think some of the exceptions to this rule that, you know, we will discuss here at MD Anderson is, you know, if the surgeon feels like a positive margin or basically he or she feels like there's a high chance after the surgery, there's going to be some disease left behind, then maybe, you know, radiation uh, can be indicated there to reduce the risk of uh, recurrence. Um, and of course, the other exception is sometimes, you know, Patients have already had a surgery and the cancer has recurred, um, and so now we, we feel like, okay, we avoided radiation the first time, but even if it's a stage one small sarcoma, if it's in a recurrent setting, we often will recommend radiation. And then when we get to stage two and three, that's really where we can't omit radiation. We'll talk about some of the data as to why that is. And then, of course, for stage four, then we have to be looking at combining the local treatment along with systemic treatments. So the next slide. Um, so I, I think this is the most important slide in my entire talk, which is surgical resection is the mainstay of treatment for the vast majority of soft tissue sarcoma. So we are heavily reliant on our surgeons to achieve a cure. And I think that's really important because, again, uh, every kind of cancer is different. Um, sarcomas in general are not curative with radiation by itself. That makes them different from potentially other tumors that are. And uh, so, you know, we don't really view radiation as a single modality to be curative for sarcoma. Um, we always, always, always want, uh, when we're achieving a cure, to have either surgery done with radiation or without radiation. That, that is the key. 
So some of the questions, you know, that I ask the surgeons who work with me um, in determining the need for radiation is, are you going to be able to take out the entire tumor with a margin? Is nerve and bone involved? What, and, you know, how does that affect the surgery that you're planning? How are you going to plan to close the wound that is going to be necessary to operate on the patient? And, you know, what are the various types of plastics techniques that you're going to use when doing the surgery? Are you going to do a graft? Are you going to need a flap? Um, or just do primary closure? You know, the next slide. So, uh, you know, uh, anytime I see a patient with a soft tissue sarcoma, of course, the first question they ask me uh, is, as a radiation doctor, why radiation? So I think it's really important to understand the history of how soft tissue sarcomas were treated before and where we are now, um, because that really puts everything into perspective. So if we go before the 1980s, um, the thought was, if you don't do an amputation, the sarcoma is going to recur. Uh, and of course, that was because radiation really hadn't, you know, come to the forefront of, you know, cancer care until after the 1980s, and so people weren't really doing it. Um, and so when they looked at their historical data before the 1980s, the local recurrence with an amputation was 10%, and when they just tried to do surgery, uh, basically a limb sparing surgery, um, the recurrence rates were very high at 30 to 60%. Um, so go to the next slide, please. So that kind of comes into the most important trial uh, that I think, you know, to date um, that we have established as surgeons and radiation doctors. So you can see uh, here the date of the study was 1982. So in the early 1980s, the thought was, well, what if we take patients and randomize them? We'll give half of the patients an amputation, and then the other half, we will do the limb sparing surgery, but this time we'll give radiation to see if that helps reduce the risk of it coming back. And that's how they designed the trial. And go to the next slide. So when we sort of look at these curves, and I know Dr. Rakan was showing uh, some Kaplan Meier curves, this is very similar. So when we look on the graph to the left, you can see here the proportion of patients that had a recurrence. The top curve is the patients had an amputation. Of course, none of them had a local recurrence. And the curve below is the uh, percent of patients that had uh, radiation along with the surgery. You can see there were some patients that 20% um, of them that did have a recurrence despite the radiation. But the key thing was, if you look on the uh, curve to the right, that in both of those, the overall percentage or chances of survival were the same. But of course, the key difference is in one arm, the patients were able to keep their limb, which was of course critical um, and what we want, and in the other arm, they weren't. So this sort of changed the standard of care in the early 1980s. And can we go to the next slide? So, you know, these were the, the data from that trial. So you can see here about 15% of patients that had the limb sparing surgery with radiation still had a local recurrence, but that was considered acceptable, especially considering the fact that overall survival and the risk of recurrence were was basically equivalent in both arms. So the conclusion from this trial was that limb sparing surgery and radiation is reasonable. It allows us to avoid an amputation, and this is now the standard of care. So, you know, I would highlight to the patients that radiation is the reason why a limb sparing surgery is, uh, you know, allowed. Um, before the advent of radiation in the care, um, you know, the vast majority of patients were getting amputations. And so, uh, of course, that's great that we're here now where we can avoid doing those morbid surgeries. So go to the next slide, please. So then there were two studies that basically looked at omitting radiation uh, soon after this, just to make sure, because um, that was small, that was only about 40, 50 patients. So, of course, we always want to confirm that the data are true in subsequent trials. And so uh, the first one was led out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Actually, the first author on this study is the pr current president of MD Anderson, who you guys might know, uh, Peter Pisters. Um, and so very similar to the last trial, they randomized patients between getting surgery or surgery and brachytherapy, which is a form of radiation that uses um, radioactive seeds that are implanted where the, the tumor sat. Um, so can we go to the next slide? So the data from this trial showed that in, when you avoid radiation um, and you just do the surgery, um, definitely there is a higher risk of the tumor coming back. So 82% a local control uh, versus 69%, uh, and that was significant um, and uh, you know favored the uh, again confirming the role of radiation. So can we go to the next slide? So around the same time, uh, the NCI uh, led another study uh, which was asking the same question. And uh, they randomized their patients to no radiation or post-operative radiation. And that was not done with brachytherapy, but the more conventional external beam radiation, which is what, what we do for the vast majority of our patients. And it, uh, if we go to the next slide, you can see the data from this study basically echoed 
um, the prior study by Dr. Pisters, which is that when you avoid radiation, um, you know, there is a very high risk of recurrence uh, in a limb sparing surgery. So 70% of patients did have a recurrence when you avoided radiation and uh, greater than, there, there was greater than 90% local control on this study with both surgery and radiation. Um, and so once these two studies were published, it, it then just further confirmed that, you know, radiation is critical um, in the management of these patients when a limb sparing surgery is being performed. Can we go to the next slide? So, you know, this, there's a big spectrum uh, when we look at the, um, the, the various types of surgical procedures that can be done. Of course, um, we now know that ra radical amputation or radical excisions are adequate, but of course they're crippling. Um, we know with radiation, wide local excision uh, or a myectomy, uh, which is, you know, removing the entire muscle that's involved, um, are adequate as long as you do the radiation. And then now we know that even if you're doing radiation, an intracapsular excision or a marginal excision where you're leaving some of the tumor behind, radiation does not make up for that. So the goal is always to do radiation with a wide local excision that uh, takes the tumor out with about a one and a half to two centimeter margin. Go to the next slide. So what about the timing of radiation? Um, go to the next slide. So that, again, for any time we have a question as physicians, it leads us into uh, a trial to answer it. So this was done uh, out of Canada. Uh, and if you just uh, hit next, we'll go through a few animations. Sorry about that. Um, so this was 182 patients. Next. 88 patients got pre-op, 94 patients got post-op. So, you know, is there is one better than the other? So one thing I do want to highlight here is that the post-op dose is higher. It was 66 to 70 gray. And then if you go to the pre-op dose, which is the next button, that was 50 gray. Um, so we've kind of knew that uh, in a preoperative setting, um, we didn't necessarily need as high of a dose. Uh, I don't need to necessarily go into the radiobiological explanation for that, but that's sort of what the studies uh, on uh, animals and basically in the lab were showing. So that's why the trial did take the post-op patients to a higher dose. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, the primary endpoint of this trial was actually the risk of developing an acute wound complication after the surgery because it was thought that if you do preoperative radiation, the risk of a, a wound complication would be higher. And sure enough, if we go to the next slide, that's uh, actually exactly what the trial showed. Um, so the local recurrence was the same. So we, we know that whether the radiation is given before or after the surgery, the risk of it coming back is the same. So both excellent at greater than 90%. But what was found to be different is indeed there was a higher risk of wound, developing a wound complication within three months of the surgery in the arm that got preoperative radiation. So about 35% of patients in that arm uh, did develop a wound complication. That could have been a persist, like a, a, a drain basically needing uh, to be there for a while because of uh, essentially inflammation or inflammatory fluid. Um, it could have been an infection um, or, or it could have just been a prolonged uh, wound that was not healing uh, in the average amount of time that it takes to heal. Um, so that basically, uh, you know, the thought was, okay, well, now we should be doing post-operative radiation. But a few years later, if we go to the next slide, when they followed these patients out, um, they actually found that, sure, maybe there was an increased risk of wound complications in the patients getting preoperative radiation, but due to the higher dose and due to the larger field in the post-operative setting, the long-term toxicities of radiation, such as uh, fibrosis of the soft tissue, edema, which is basically swelling, or joint stiffness were, were higher. Um, and, you know, some of these were non-significant on this trial, but then there were other studies coming around, around, around the same time that basically confirmed that that post-operative radiation, although it was uh, reducing the risk of a acute wound complication, actually has a longer, uh, uh, basically a higher rates of long-term side effects. Can we go to the next slide? So, uh, again, to summarize, what, what we learned from these studies is that Local control rates are the same with preoperative and postoperative radiation. we we'll go to the next slide. But what tends to be different is in preoperative radiation, we counsel that uh, our patients that you are at a higher risk of acute wound complications, but this tends to be reversible. You get an infection, uh, we give you antibiotics. You develop a seroma, we put a drain. Um, you, you know, have some wound complication, we loop in our plastic surgeons to help with the, the, the closure if there's an issue. But post-operative radiation for those patients, we now know that those side effects of edema, fibrosis, decreased range of motion, 
um, are not irreversible. There's no antibiotic, there's no drain, there's no fix for that. So we of course want to uh, avoid the toxicities that are irreversible and instead accept some of the toxicities that can still be fixed with the preoperative radiation. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, again, to summarize, uh, equivalent efficacy, different toxicities, so treatment approach should be individualized. I shouldn't say that postoperative radiation is wrong. It's technically accepted and it's in the standard of care as written by the NCCN. Um, and sometimes it is indicated. If we have tumors that are potentially ulcerating through the skin, where we know that wound healing is going to be an issue regardless, sometimes we do favor surgery up front. But I would say at MD Anderson, and actually at most sarcoma centers around the world, based upon the guidelines uh, laid out by our Radiation Oncology Society, um, 90 to 95 percent of patients are recommended to get preoperative radiation and a very small subset get postoperative radiation. Can we go to the next slide? So I just have one more basically small piece uh, to talk about, which is, you know, how long is the radiation and, you know, what, what, what does that entail? So historically, all of these trials, I, th I think you guys uh, saw 50 gray was the dose that was settled upon for preoperative radiation. That is given every day, uh, two gray a day over five weeks, right? So it takes us five weeks to get to that number of 50. Um, so that's not easy. It, it's not easy for patients to undergo that locally, and it's certainly you know, we, some of the earlier talks today talked about the importance of going to a sarcoma center for treatment. And so a lot of our patients travel from out of town at, at MD Anderson and same with other sarcoma centers around the country. So we have to acknowledge that that is not trivial to expect patients to stay for over a month um, in a city that's foreign to them, basically. Um, so can we go to the next slide? So one of the things uh, that we were particularly interested in looking at as radiation oncologists at, at MD Anderson is, can we give a little bit more dose per day uh, that allows us to hit that magical number of 50 or at least a biologically equivalent dose to that 50 gray in a shorter amount of time. Um, and so we devised a regimen of 42.75 gray of radiation in 15 fractions. So that's three weeks of radiation, five days a week. Um, and we treated about 130 patients uh, on this study. And we wanted to see, A, is the rate of uh, recurrence the same, and B, is it safe to do that? Is it safe to go at a higher dose per day, um, uh, or is it not? And our endpoint, very similarly to the Canadian trial, was uh, basically the rate of developing a wound complication. And what we found is it was not statistically dif different from our historical control. It was 31%, which is right around where uh, the Canadian uh, trial, which was, I think, 35%. Um, and so this is now considered to be an acceptable and safe alternative to 50 gray of radiation in five weeks. Um, and as you can see here, the local control is uh, two, uh, at two years is, is 93%. So still excellent. Less than 10% of patients have had a recurrence on the study, which again is in line with uh, sort of historical data. Um, so longer follow-up is needed. And of course, we're just waiting for a few more years to go by. And we just want to make sure that the rates of late toxicities uh, such as the edema, fibrosis, and joint stiffness aren't higher with this regimen. Um, and so once we get that data, we will be publishing it shortly, um, but I think we're still a few years away from that. And I think that's the last slide. Um, so, uh, you know, basically uh, sarcoma management is complex. Um, you know, we talked about surgery being critical. Uh, radiation allows for a limb sparing resection. We prefer preoperative radiation. Um, and there's some emerging data that we can shorten the regimen of radiation from five weeks to three weeks. And uh, that's it. I'm well, happy to take questions. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rattan and Dr. Kuduki. Both extremely well. informative presentations. Um, I know that Dr. Rattan and also thank you so much to um, Dr. Nassif for also helping out with Q&A uh, for the past 30 minutes or so. Um, I know that a lot of questions have been answered in the chat box already, but if anyone else has additional questions, please feel free to pop those into the chat box. Um, we have a few more minutes left for Q&A. So I think the only question that I didn't answer, and I'll just read it uh, for Hassan to respond because it was kind of a radiation question. Uh, was um, from a patient saying, we were advised to go for amputation because radiation is not an option after limb sparing surgery due to the fact that radiation will interfere with the graft. Is that correct? Uh, I would say that is incorrect. Um, so, you know, of course, I every case is different. 
Um, but there is the thought that radiation affects the integrity of a graft, and that's not really based on any data. We do do, again, post-operative radiation from time to time. And certainly in our melanoma patients, which, uh, you know, uh, is another subset of patients that I treat, actually post-operative radiation is indicated, and a lot of those patients do get grafts and flaps. And when we, we, we do it, I would say less than 10% of patients have a graft failure or flap failure. Um, so I, I would say that that, uh, you know, again, from personal experience is an incorrect statement. There may be a little bit of a risk, a higher risk. I'm not saying it's impossible or that radiation doesn't, but I, I wouldn't go to say that every patient with a graft has a failure with radiation. I would actually say if that's the case, it's a very small minority of patients. You just need to wait to let the graft sort of take and heal. And the window to do post-operative radiation is about three months. So there's a lot of time. So a lot of times, you know, sarcoma patients will get surgery on the outside. They'll come to us for post-operative radiation, um, and they're in a rush. Um, but we, we would definitely want to wait. Um, so we double-check with the surgeon, the plastic surgeon. But if you give that time for the tissue to heal and then you do post-operative radiation, there, there should be very minimal risk of a long-term graft failure. Uh, so I think I see a question about SIVA sheets. Um, that's, that's a very interesting question. So that's basically a form of that brachytherapy that we were talking about earlier um, that, you know, was done in the 90s. Um, so it, it, it can be done. Um, I think there's uh, data emerging actually out of uh, Florida, uh, or, which is where, where I've seen it, where they, you know, intraoperatively deliver the radiation. Um, so uh, it's everything I've read regarding fever sheets is in a sm small subset, about 10 to 15 patients. Whereas with external beam radiation, we're looking at historical data spanning, you know, decades and treating over thousands of patients. Um, so I think it's still an area to explore, and it certainly may be more convenient for patients to have the radiation done intraoperatively. But I wouldn't say um, we're there yet where we can accept it as a 100% standard, but, you know, we, we should explore that. Um, radiation treatment suitable for children? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. I think if there's an age cutoff that we're taught, um, you know, of course, any child under three where their tissues are actively dividing rapidly, um, radiation is contraindicated. Um, but, you know, pediatric sarcomas are treated a, a little bit differently than adult soft tissue sarcomas. Um, the biology is different. The dosing is different. Um, but, you know, in, in, in those cases where there's strong data, where radiation is helping improve survival or reduce risk of recurrence, um, which are actually a lot of the pediatric sarcomas, yes, it is indicated and it is um, done. All right, um, there's another question about particle beam or carbon ion therapies. Um, so that is a great question. I, you know, at MD Anderson, we have a proton therapy center. Um, I do treat, uh, and my colleagues do use protons when it is indicated. I think the important thing to realize about proton therapy compared to standard x-ray radiation is the dose is actually the same. So the chances of cure are exactly the same. The, the times that we consider using protons are when there's a benefit to the dosimetry. So if the tumor is abutting something critical with proton radiation, there's less exit dose. And so we tend to use it for sarcomas that are superficial, adjacent to the spine, where we really want a sharp dose fall off. Um, but that's not to say that doing photon radiation in those cases is wrong. Um, but if the data is telling us when we run comparative plans that protons may be safer or spare a patient of a side effect, it is uh, definitely, we, we do push for that. And a lot of times we do have to argue with the insurance companies to approve it. Um, and then carbon ion, you know, there's very few carbon ion facilities uh, in the world, I believe only in Europe and Japan. We're looking to get one at MD Anderson. I believe Florida is getting one in, in Jacksonville. Um, but carbons are really exciting because they actually are like protons, but they deliver even a more stronger biological dose. And uh, in, in the, I guess what I'm trying to say is in Japan and some of the few studies I've seen with carbons, um, they're doing it in lieu of surgery or in patients where surgery isn't an option. Um, and there is some pretty, again, exciting data that that more powerful aspect of carbons is beneficial, especially to treat sarcomas. So, yes, that is an active uh, thing we are looking to do. But, of course, you know, they're very expensive. Um, but we hope to get one, and we hope to run prospective studies looking at that. Because um, I do think that that's sort of the next step is can we use these newer forms of radiation um, to treat and cure patients where surgery maybe is not an option. Um, uh, I see one other question about MR-LINAC radiation. So MR uh, basically stands for MRI. 
and linear accelerator, uh, accelerator is what the LINAC stands for. Um, so all that basically is, is it's a linear accelerator that uses an MRI for daily image guidance. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it's really anything super special um, because what we do at MD Anderson, what most centers do is when we do CT-based planning, we fuse it with the MRI that the patient's getting, um, which has actually worked perfectly. So when uh, we've tried to do MR-guided linear acceleration, or basically based uh, MR linac-based radiation at MD Anderson, we haven't really seen a difference because we do have one, um, just because the the uh, the the CT base is just as good. We just use the the MRI and we use it to do our target delineation. Um, so I don't I I wouldn't say that it's any better. Um, but sometimes if we really want a soft tissue, uh, you know, contrast based image guidance every day, that's the benefit of the MR linac is when the patient comes, we get an MRI on the table and we can just make some, you know, millimeter based changes to account for that change in anatomy. Um, but again, I don't think if you're not getting MR linac that you're missing out on anything. Does that uh, help answer your question? Right. Um, and I see another one about radiation uh, to SFT near the heart. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I actually just treated an, an SFT that was close to the heart. Um, and so that I actually did protons because again, I think that's one of the advantage of protons is you don't get that follow through. So I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't say it's uh, too risky. I think if, if done appropriately um, uh, and as long as the heart is meeting the radiation dose constraints, I think it, it, it can be done safely. I wouldn't view that as a contraindication. They're all very great questions. All right, thank you so much for your thorough answers to those questions. Um, are there any additional questions? I'll do maybe like one to two more minutes of Q&A if there's anything else that we wanna cover. Um, I see, I think two more questions. Um, so is gamma knife proton? Uh, it, gamma knife is not proton. So gamma knife is a form of X-ray radiation that basically uh, isn't a linear accelerator. It's uh, 181 pencil beams that are directed at a single sort of point. So we use gamma knife at MD Anderson solely to treat uh, head and neck based tumors or in particular brain metastases or brain tumors um, because it basically requires a frame to be fixed onto the head. So for sarcomas that tend to not go to the brain, uh, we very rarely see head and neck sarcomas. You know, I think gamma knife is, you know, less than 1% of our patient population. Um, and, and, and that's not proton based, that's uh, x-ray based. Um, and then the, the, the last question is radiation to the hand post-surgery. Do you see hand function problems later in life? Um, so it kind of depends where in the hand and again, what the modality is. What we've, what our studies have shown is the, uh, you know, the palms are tend to be more uh, sensitive to the long-term effects of radiation compared to maybe the dorsal aspect. Um, so whenever we are treating patients with palmer based radiation, we do advise our patients that yes, in the long-term, you are at about a 40, 50% risk of having sort of like, um, you know, some impairment in your hand function. Uh, but again, that's not to say that sometimes when we treat tumors more uh, on this aspect, we can't use, for example, protons or a uh, beam configuration that spares. And in those ca uh, cases, I think there's a much less risk of having sort of long-term impairment. Um, I'm not sure about uh, the pecomas question to the brain. Um, Ravine, do you know what is the risk of that off the top of your head? That's extraordinary unlikely. Uh, I've never seen it, yeah. um, but not, not an expected reality, although weird things can happen. And if, that, if that's a case someone finds himself in, um, it's something that we could help them manage, but that's not expected. And then is radiation effective for a well-differentiated liposarcoma? Um, I would say yes. So well-differentiated liposarcomas tend to recur locally. At the very beginning of my talk, I talked about a spectrum. Um, and it's the well-differentiated liposarcomas that we see oftentimes recur after a surgery in the same spot. So uh, we do uh, consider 
Weldiff liposarcoma to be one of the histologies where we would advocate for radiation, especially in a recurrent setting, um, or where a sur if, if the surgeon feels like they would uh, have difficulty in achieving a negative margin. Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone, so much. I appreciate, uh, you know, you guys having me here today and, uh, you know, just letting